Hello everyone, I am the Script Monk, and welcome to part two on the movie which has now consumed two full months of my life, the woefully misunderstood Matrix Resurrections. If you haven't seen part one of this video, please click on the link above or in the description below, because I'm going to be continuing a lot of stuff from that video, hopefully without too much re-explanation. And side note, if you're just looking for me to dunk on this movie, or if you're this guy, I've got zero tolerance for anything that requires a syllabus and a highlighter. This is not the video for you. I suggest this one. Because for those of you who stay, it's gonna get hot and brainy in here. Yeah, ideas are the new sexy. And who's sexier than this guy, am I right? To recap part one, if you look closely and know how to read the code, you'll find that Matrix Resurrections is not intended to be a straightforward continuation of the original Matrix trilogy. It is rather a work of meta-cinema about the Matrix franchise, specifically the immense psychological toll it has taken on the mind of its creators. And as part of this meta-artistic discourse, Keanu Reeves does not actually play Neo in this film, but a symbolic stand-in for Lana Wachowski herself, who I've simply dubbed the creator. And through this symbolic stand-in, Matrix Resurrections becomes an intensely personal story of an artist who has lost grips on their identity, been crushed under the pressures of the pop culture industry, and become entrapped by a creation which now consumes their life, leading to mental crisis and total psychotic breakdown. And since Resurrections accomplishes all this through ambiguity, symbolic double meanings, and playing games with its audience, Matrix Resurrections meets all the criteria for an art film. And as previously explained, the key to unlocking Resurrections art film code may be found in Jungian analytical psychology. Carl Jung's psychological archetypes were the basis for the original Matrix, but Resurrections takes Jung to another level by presenting all things for the subjectivity of a protagonist suffering an intense mental crisis. All the strange and confusing content of the story's first half can be explained by the Jungian mantra, perception is projection. See, the creator's invented world of the Matrix has so consumed his mental life that he has come to unconsciously associate his fictional characters with the three major parts of his psyche, his ego, his shadow, and his unconscious anima. And as the creator's mind grows more and more unstable, he becomes unable to differentiate these fictional characters from the psychic realities to which they've become attached. So the creator begins to perceive himself as Neo, while projecting his shadow and anima upon the Jonathan Groff and Carrie Ann Moss roles, in the form of his fictional characters Agent Smith and Trinity. And since we, the viewers, are forced to perceive all things through the warped subjectivity of the protagonist, we are fooled by these delusions as well. And as the creator descends into the waking dreams of schizophrenia, two Jungian archetypes appear the Herald, and the Child, on a mission to lead the creator deep into his unconscious so his psychic healing may begin. Thus, part one of the story concludes with the creator's ego crossing the barrier of consciousness into the dark, shadowy underground of his psyche. Now, since part one of this film takes place in the creator's actual everyday world, and part two is wholly contained in the coma dream of the creator's unconscious, Resurrections is split into two exclusive courses of narrative, which operate by two completely different sets of rules. This means first and foremost that everything in part two should be read quite differently from how it was read in part one. To help make sense of this difference, let's compare Resurrections to another film divided into two planes of consciousness, The Wizard of Oz. Like Resurrections, Wizard of Oz also begins in the protagonist's actual everyday world, but then jumps into a fantastic world of dream. The Land of Oz is not an actual physical location, but exists only in Dorothy's unconscious as she lay in bed recovering from a blow to the head. And as typical in Dream, Dorothy's unconscious uses the familiar faces of waking life to populate her mental drama. Mean Miss Gulch just transformed into the Wicked Witch, while the farmhands Hunk, Hickory, and Zeke become the faces of the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion. But these, of course, are not the actual persons nor do they represent the actual persons. Dorothy's mind merely uses these figures to give form to a psychic drama about personal growth and maturation. Miss Gulch as the Witch is merely a symbolization of Dorothy's adolescent fears. The Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion are merely archetypes for mental faculties that must mature in Dorothy in order for her to face those fears. And while none of the events in Oz are in any way real, this dream journey nevertheless leads Dorothy to real psychological change, which according to Jung is the ultimate function of dream archetypes. In the same way, part two of Resurrections presents a dream adventure through which the creator's shattered mind is made whole once more. And like in Oz, this essentially takes the form of a fairy tale. Jung saw a lot of significance in fairy tales. 
as the repeated tropes of these tales simplify and accentuate common archetypal scenarios found in dreams. And of particular importance is the rescue of a princess. And what is part two of Resurrections, if not the rescue of a princess imprisoned by a monster? But one thing to remember is that like the differences between the farmhands and Dorothy's three companions, whenever we encounter the Moss, Groff, and Harris roles here in the dream world of part two, these no longer represent the actual persons found in part one. The creator's unconscious has merely used the images of these persons to represent the deep, powerful forces of his psyche. But before proceeding to the story of part two, I gotta do some basic film criticism. Because the execution of part two is definitely inferior to that of part one. See, most of the intellectual games that made part one so intriguing get put on the back burner in favor of something that far more resembles a typical Matrix type story. Now it's my best guess that the writers gave in to studio demands to give us something more recognizable. So part two tries to play it both ways, as both art film and a commercial genre blockbuster. But this leads to the typical sticking point of practically any Wachowski film. See, the Wachowskis have always been a bit too intellectual for the type of spectacular, action-driven movies they like to create. Dialectical in nature and a thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And this mixture of brains and spectacle proves difficult to pull off and has thus been the source of both their greatest triumphs and their biggest disappointments. For while the OG Matrix seems to get this balance right, many of the shortcomings of their later films can be traced to the points where their intellectual ambitions come into conflict with the basic needs of a commercial, action-driven genre story. And I see this as the cause of the mushiness of part two. By trying to play it both ways, this section becomes this awkward stew of incongruous elements that makes it unclear what's supposed to continue the art film discourse and what's just there as a cheap way to advance the plot. For example, hey, they brought Sati back. Do you know that Sati is a goddess in Hindu mythology after whom is named the practice of widows throwing themselves on their husband's funeral pyre? Is this relevant? Probably not, seeing as Sati never sacrifices herself in any way. She just seems to have been added as a convenient way to bring about the story's big rescue. What are we to make of Zion becoming Io? Did you know that Io is a Greek mythical woman who is transformed into a cow? Well, that's probably a dead end. But Niobe was another Greek mythical woman who witnessed the murder of her 14 children and transformed into a rock that never stopped crying. Could there be something to how this weeping rock of a woman now rules the citadel that represents the seat of the collective human soul? Maybe. But then why is she growing strawberries? However, despite of all this tossed salad, the basic armature of a Jungian archetypal myth remains intact and many of the meta-artistic elements from part one continue to linger under the surface. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. Specifically, I'm gonna answer the six most confusing and controversial questions people have about this section of the film. Namely, I'm gonna explain, why does the opening of part two repeat act two A of the original Matrix on an almost scene by scene basis? Why is reuniting with Trinity so damn important? What is the deal with the Groff character popping up those two times? Exactly who or what is the analyst? Why does Trinity become more powerful than Neo in the end? And finally, what is the meaning of the final scene? And I know I've already given like three false starts without getting into the meat of this video, but there's still one more thing you gotta know to make sense of what follows. See, all the confusion surrounding the questions I just listed come from how part two is executed as a dream narrative. See, dreams never have a singular meaning, but rather a manifold meaning. Dreams are confusing because they speak in several different languages about several different things all at the same time. And similarly, part two of Resurrections tries to carry on four modes of conversation all at once, sometimes taking turns, sometimes with two or more speaking simultaneously. This means that some actions and pieces of dialogue have more than one meaning, while others only make sense when read a certain way. First, we have the story on its literal level. That is, the story is a straightforward narrative about characters taking actions to achieve desired goals. Second, we have the symbolic level, where we recognize everything to be part of the creator's unconscious dream. Here, characters and events have a symbolic psychological meaning. Characters do not represent actual persons, but they're merely dream representations of certain forces in the creator's psyche. Going deeper into the symbolic discourse, we find a more nuanced conversation on the special roles archetypes play in the lives and minds of creative artists, which I'll speak more on when appropriate. Finally, we have the meta-artistic level, where the writers continue their commentary on the Matrix films, the movie industry, and their place within that system. I'm trying not to be too confusing, but you'll see how these four modes mix together and come and go as we unravel the mysteries in the following sections. Alright, let's go. 
Part two of the story begins with a sequence that appears to repeat virtually every scene from the original Matrix's early Act 2A, though not exactly in the same order. Once again, our protagonist awakes in his pod. He's brought aboard the ship, he's worked over on the table. He meets a Morphei in the Construct and spars with that Morphei in the dojo. He awakes in his cell and has a conversation with the captain. He is then introduced to the crew in a close recreation of the original scene. Now, any observant viewer will have noticed how Resurrections repeatedly quotes the original trilogy, but this section gives a self-quotation at its extreme. The question is why? Is this just the lazy appeal to nostalgia we find in so many other legacy sequels? Well, not exactly. We must remember firstly that Resurrections is a work of meta-cinema about the Matrix franchise. And secondly, that Keanu is not actually playing Neo in this movie, but the creator who invented this franchise and has since lost his mind on account of it. And like the toilet graffiti in part one, this section gives us a subtle clue to aid our interpretation. The name of the ship is the Nemocene. Fire up your Wikipedia and you'll find that Nemocene was the Greek goddess of memory. Not only that, she was the mother of the Nine Muses, the entities who provided inspiration for creative artists. The ship is thus a symbolic vehicle for the creator's memory as he struggles to come to terms with his once beloved creation. Look at this, we have a philosophical discussion between a creator and one of his own creations about the act of creation itself. And here, we need only substitute a few words to find the lament of an artist over the commoditization of his work. They took your story and turned it into something trivial. That's what the Matrix does. And weaponizes every idea, every dream. But everything's not exactly the same. And as the child shows the creator, in the past 20 years, his work has taken on a life of its own, inspiring an entire new generation to continue what he started. With this, the child convinces the creator that his work indeed had meaning, freeing his mind to move on to new territory. You know what this is? I used The Wizard of Oz earlier, but now I'm going to go with Charles Dickens. This is the Ghost of Christmas Past sequence. Now that the archetypes have helped the creator through his initial resistance, the character sets sight on what will be the main story goal of part two, to reunite the creator with Trinity. But once again, the question is why? Why is freeing Trinity so damn important? And isn't it being a bit selfish to put all of humanity at risk just because the protagonist misses his girlfriend? But once again, we shouldn't take things so literally. I said how the story of part one is basically the rescue of a princess. And in the Jungian interpretation of storytelling, a princess rescue represents the ego's need to reunite with its anima. As I've said before, the anima or animus is the archetype for one's missing half, the yin to the ego's yang, lost during early childhood. The names anima and animus literally mean soul and spirit. So, in the quest for psychic wholeness that Jung calls individuation, it is essential to find and reintegrate oneself with this lost soul or spirit. And since, among other things, the anima is considered the feminine counterpart of the male ego, and the animus the masculine counterpart of the female ego, these archetypes are typically represented in stories as some form of beautiful princess or prince, and their reunion with their ego symbolizes some kind of romance. Now I said in my last video how the creator has unconsciously attached his anima to the image of his fictional character Trinity, and in his confused mental state, he tries to compensate for his missing anima by projecting this archetype upon the woman in the coffee shop, Tiffany. Here in the dream world of part two, this conflation of identities continues, but now this figure represents the anima itself, merely wearing the dream form of Tiffany slash Trinity. Thus, when the story is viewed on its symbolic union level, the need for Trinity's rescue is obvious. The creator's anima is held hostage by some deep unconscious demon. This demon must be defeated for the creator to reclaim his lost half and become whole once more. With this realization, the metaphors found on the story's literal level become much clearer. We can understand why this new matrix needs both Neo and Trinity, how it's powered by their bond, and why the creator is kept in perpetual agony by a separation from the Trinity figure. This new matrix is simply a dream metaphor for the creator's psyche itself and the rescue of Trinity, the quest to reunite the ego with its missing half. Therefore, the explosion that occurs when Neo and Trinity finally touch hands isn't to be chalked up to something as cheap and sentimental as the power of love. This is rather the enormous psychic potential unleashed when the ego and anima are united once more. And just like in the original movie, the hero does not unlock his ultimate power until he is fully bonded with the anima figure to create the psychically unified one. And they do become one. You'll notice in the final scene how they seem to speak with a single mind, completing each other's thoughts. Just remind people what a free mind can do. I forgot. It's easy to forget. He makes it easy. 
that it does. Now we could leave it at this, but there's even more to this rescue if you look at it from our third artistic level of symbolic discourse. Carl Jung believed the anima or animus to be the source of artistic intuition, the well of human creativity, basically the artist's soul. Thus, any great artist will be connected with their anima or animus and when severed will become creatively blocked and emotionally unfulfilled. With this in mind, the rescue of Trinity takes on an even higher symbolic meaning. The creator is fighting for the artistic soul stolen from him by a certain monstrous force. What is this force? Well, one step at a time. Because as Jung tells us, the ego has no hope of reaching this stage unless it first overcomes the preliminary challenge imposed by the other crucial archetype, the shadow. Which leads to our next question. What the heck is Jonathan Groff doing here? Now in my previous video, I explained the archetype of the shadow, how the creator has identified his shadow with his fictional character Agent Smith, and how the creator has projected his shadow onto his business associate played by Jonathan Groff. So when this figure makes a surprise appearance in the creator's dream world, this is no longer his business associate, nor is it actually the fictional character Agent Smith. This is rather a personification of the creator's shadow itself which, thanks to the previous acts of projection, has now adopted the physical form of Groff's character. So, this scene must not be read as an interaction between Neo and Agent Smith. This is rather a confrontation between the two conflicting sides of the creator's identity, between his ego, the way he consciously wishes to see himself, and his shadow, those aspects of himself he denies or represses. The ego and shadow are thus not two separate individuals, but a duality within the same mind. Binaries that form the nature of things. Ones and zeros, light and dark, Anderson and Smith. If left unchecked, the shadow can do much harm. So the first step in Jungian individuation is to confront and take control of one's shadow. As such, the conflict between these two figures is a battle for dominance over the psyche. But once the shadow is conquered, it may become a useful ally. For one shadow is not entirely negative, it may contain useful qualities that can serve one well when facing the fears and traumas deeper in the unconscious. Hence Groff's second surprise appearance at the end of Act 2b. For while naturally antagonistic, the ego and the shadow are inseparably linked, and the self grows far stronger when these two forces are aligned towards a common cause. But what rejected qualities does this shadow actually represent? Well, let's shift again to our third mode of discourse. In my last video, I compared Resurrections to the film Adaptation, and here again we find a great parallel. In this quasi-autobiographical tale, writer Charlie Kaufman casts himself as the story's lead, but he also invents a fictional twin brother, Donald. Whether Kaufman knew it or not, he too was playing a Jungian game. While the on-screen Charlie represents Kaufman's ego, the way he consciously perceives himself as a writer and artist, in Donald we find everything Kaufman secretly hates or fears about himself as a writer, that he is simply a talentless buffoon who actually knows nothing. Donald is Kaufman's shadow, and thus becomes the irritating specter who haunts Charlie as he struggles to write his screenplay. Back to Resurrections, I previously mentioned how the creator projected his shadow onto his business associate because this slick yuppie embodies everything the creator likely despises about himself as a commercial artist. We might thus conclude the ego-shadow conflict to be a dramatization of the conflict in the heart of every commercial artist. On one side is the desire to see oneself as a true artist who produces work of value and meaning. On the other side is the temptation to give in to commerciality for the sake of career, money, and fame. Commercial artist is in fact an oxymoron, as the two sides are seen as diametrically opposed. When read this way, the cryptic dialogue between these two characters takes on a whole new meaning. The creator's ego declares he simply wants to reconnect with his artistic soul, the anima. But his shadow replies, I can't let you do that. See, I have big plans for this new Matrix, and they won't work if you become an artiste again. Hmm. Sounds like conflict. Inevitable. There's even a pointed comment on how the creator's artistic side has grown into a tired old man while his soulless, commercially driven side has become more youthful and thriving, which sounds like self-criticism on the Wachowski's own body of films. And, as if to drive home this point, we get what is no doubt the most out of left field inclusion in this entire film. The sudden appearance of the Merovingian, who's been transformed from an aristocrat into a filthy bum. This guy harangues the creator's ego for abandoning the ideals of high art. Look, I'm not saying this part is any good, or even that it makes much sense, but at least does seem to have been put there for a reason. One last note on this scene, it contains the first mention of the analyst as the movie's big bad. The shadow says he refuses to be the analyst's slave any longer. So exactly who or what is the analyst? And what does this mean? 
In my last video, I said how in the real world of Part 1, the Neil Patrick Harris character was simply a psychotherapist and nothing more. Yet through what is known as transference, whereby therapy patients project their feelings of animosity onto their therapists, the creator's mind uses the image of the analyst, here in the dream world of Part 2, as a stand-in for the real psychological demon which actually strangles his soul. So what is this projected force in Resurrections? What is the real monster which chokes the creator's spirit? Well, let's look at the analyst's first scene in part two, keeping in mind all four levels of this story's discourse. Here's what the story tells us on its literal level. At the end of Revolutions, Neo sacrifices himself to bring the drama to an end. No more Neo, no more Matrix. The story is over. But the analyst says, no, we can get so much more out of this. Why kill the Golden Goose? We can build a new Matrix, just as successful as the first. So for years and years, all the King's horses and all the King's men labored to put the Matrix back together again, but failed again and again because they just couldn't figure out what made the Matrix work so well in the first place. Hmm, sounds familiar. There seems to be some sort of parallel here, but with what? Yeah. A beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. See, while the analyst is supposed to serve the same story role as the architect in Reloaded, he doesn't talk anything like the architect. Instead, he talks just like a Hollywood studio wonk. He has that smiley fake personality. He calls his superior suits. He has that trademark Hollywood job insecurity. He talks of productivity records and monetary costs. Seriously, why would machines have money? But most of all, he talks about giving the people what they want. He says the people don't want what the creator's trying to achieve. The people want to be kept fat, dumb, and happy. They want stuff that'll excite their emotions, give fleeting pleasure, but never turn on their minds. And you gotta give the people what they want, because after all, it's these faceless morons who provide the fuel that keeps the machine running. Just give the people what they want, right? And through all his careful analysis, this young go-getter believes he has perfected the formula to keep this fuel flowing. And the creator needs to stop screwing around, stop thinking like an independent rebel, and get back with the damn program. So we're definitely now operating on the film's meta level of discourse. This new world of machines is also a simple metaphor for the Hollywood machine, which enslaves the creator's mind in waking life, just as it enslaves Lana Wachowski in reality. And it's this machine which holds the creator's anima hostage, in exchange for the illusion of personal success. But any real hope of artistic freedom, worth, and integrity is always kept just outside of arm's reach. Now, it might first seem contradictory that the creator's shadow should also oppose this system's machine. But when it comes down to it, an artist's career interests are actually more enslaved by this system than their creative ones. Artistry at least has some wiggle room in a commercial system, but this system has a stranglehold on the artist's career interests, dictating what it can and cannot do and keep it entrapped in contracts. So the creator's shadow actually hates the system just as much as the ego, creating the one point where their two sets of interests are actually aligned. So with all parts of the self working together, the demon is overcome, but the story's not yet over. We're given the fairy tale trope of the magical flight home, which leads to this moment, where the unified ego and anima are forced into a leap of faith. But then, this happens. And everyone's all like, what? Well, this is certainly a new twist in the Jungian myth, but it still has a definite Jungian explanation. Let's back up a sec. So, the ego and the anima, that is the masculine and feminine sides of the creator's psyche, have been reunified. This means they are no longer two separate entities, but two halves of a single individual. Now, here's how Jung believed this masculine-feminine duality to work. Like in Taoism, while there's a duality of masculine and feminine in all things, one is typically dominant. So if you hold a male identity, the masculine personality traits are forefronted in the ego, while the feminine traits are obscured behind in the anima. Likewise, if you have a female identity, the feminine traits are forefronted in the ego, while the masculine traits are obscured behind in the animus. But what has happened here in Resurrections is this. Ah, wait, let me show you that again. The feminine side comes to the forefront as dominant while the masculine side recedes into the secondary. Do I have to spell it out for you? I've said how Resurrections is really the story of Lana Wachowski reclaiming her identity as an artist. 
and no artist can be true to their work if they carry a false persona and are not first true to themselves. So as we see in our Alana Wachowski stand-in, there is a transposition in which gender figure represents the ego hero. The feminine archetype of Trinity takes over the role of the ego, the conscious identity, the I am, while the masculine archetype of Neo shifts into the role of Animus. And with that, taking all we've learned thus far, we can decipher the meaning of the final scene. Here our Wachowski stand-in, psychically healed and made whole once more, confronts the system that has enslaved her for the past 20 years. And the system says, oh, good for you, so you took your matrix back, bravo. Well, let me tell you something, sister. The people aren't going to like this. The people don't want art. They don't want creative self-expression that makes them think. I know what the people want. They like the dribble I feed them. They're not going to want your matrix. To which our hero replies, bitch, I don't give a fudge. This is my creation. You stole it from me, and now I've taken it back. And we're going to show the world what people like us can do without you and your lousy system. And then, with great irony, she looks the system in the eye and says, Thank you. Thank you for the hell you have put me through. Because if it hadn't been for the system's greed and tyranny, if it hadn't been for its demand to create another damn matrix, she would have never gotten the chance to reclaim her world and become the person she truly ought to be. And with this, Lana Wachowski declares victory. She has wrenched her creation back from the jaws of the very beast that swallowed it and reclaimed herself as an artist. And I think that's goddamn beautiful. Now, final evaluations. Some people have the idea that I'm suggesting Resurrections to be some kind of hidden Citizen Kane or something. No, of course not. This movie still has a lot of obvious flaws. If it didn't, I wouldn't need a whole hour to explain the thing. First of all, it certainly could have done a better job cueing its audience on how to read its content. Secondly, it contains way too much incongruous material with no clear purpose. Wachowski films have a frequent problem with narrative coherency, and this is definitely the case here as well. And thirdly, by trying to play things both ways in part two, the film essentially kneecaps itself, both as an art film and a commercial genre movie. Whenever a story tries to be two things at once, it usually succeeds in neither. And by giving in to the studio demands to give the audience what they want, the film really undercuts the defiance of its own conclusion. And this really points to the crux of Resurrection's failure with audiences. I call this a secret art film because all the art film discourse was done under the disguise of a commercial genre blockbuster, which is ultimately counterproductive because it confuses the audience over how it should process everything it sees. Yet despite all this, I'm giving this movie a B. B for ballsy. Because even if you call this a failed experiment, I've gained so much respect for Lana Makowski because it takes so much more guts to try and fail than to wimp out and play it safe. And Lana could have taken the easy route. She could have accepted the dump truck full of money and given us another Terminator Genesis, another Dial of Destiny, another good day to die hard. But instead, Lana had the guts to subvert all expectations and do something brazen with a tired old franchise to fill it with new value and meaning and do it right under the studio's nose. Lana may be a woman now, but she still has a ton of balls. Because when it comes down to it, this is an angry, defiant movie expressing 20 years of pent-up frustration. When I say Resurrections is secretly awesome, I mean it's punk rock awesome. Punk rock is not about the quality of the music. Punk rock is an attitude. It's intentionally subversive and designed to piss certain people off. It throws two middle fingers in the air and says, this is what I think of your system, and this is what I think of your expectations. Why do you think Lana has hair like that? She's punk as hell. Okay, so Resurrections failed the box office. But do you really think Lana Wachowski gives two shits if Warners makes a dime off this movie? Dude, she casts the studio as the villain, whom her stand-in repeatedly murders in the final scene. The joke is on them. Heck, what a better way to get Warners to quit bugging her about new sequels. Be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. So just like her own character in Resurrections, Lana Wachowski has reclaimed her identity as an artist. And whether you like her movie or not, you gotta respect that. Because in my book, the worst thing a movie could be is cowardly. Which will be my chief complaint against the next movie I look at. A movie I'm sure we'll have no arguments about. Ugh. Until then, I'm the Scrum Monk. Rock on.